Good morning again. Good morning. morning. Say congratulations. We made it to the last session of the week. Good work. Um, And I want to thank you for sticking with me all this week as we studied God's Word together. Um, My prayer today, and really it was for the whole week, is that God's Word will take root in your hearts and minds and lives, ready to produce spiritual fruit. So just to quickly review where we've been so far. On day one, we looked at Paul's prayer for wisdom for the Colossian people. On day two, we looked at what does it mean to make Jesus first place in all of our lives, give him that priority over all those other things that we care about. On the third day was kind of the pivotal day. We looked at that idea that we are rooted in Christ. We're rooted and built up in Christ. And yesterday, we started getting really practical. We started talking about the old clothes and putting off the old self. And today, I'm looking forward to talking about putting on the new clothes. But what exactly would that look like? Hmm. Hmm. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. That was, that was good. That is the language that the Bible is using as it talks about putting off the old clothes and putting on the new clothes. Taking off um, those things that, well in this case it doesn't really apply, but putting off those things that were not appropriate for what it means if someone was raised with Christ and putting on those things that are. And so this morning we're going to be spending all of our time talking about what does it mean to put on, put on Jesus. So thinking back to Colossians 3, 1 to 4, and really 5 through 12, I believe, Paul has called us to a heavenly perspective in our lives. A perspective that will come from our new identities in Christ rather than the identities we used to find. We died to our old selves and have been raised with him. And in our last session, we looked at aspects of the old self that we needed to remove. But now, Paul's coming back to the, new, the positive side of our new identity. We're people of the new self. And so what does that look like? I want to look at Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14, if you could turn there with me. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. <clears throat> Verse 12. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So there's one main command in this passage, and that is put on or more literally, clothe yourself. Clothe yourself, like what we just saw in that skit. Just like we put away the old clothing that represents a sin that ran rampant in our lives before we knew Christ, also because we had no power over it, now Paul is telling us to put on or clothe ourselves with these five virtues that reflect Jesus' character. 
I'll list them for you again, what we just read. First is compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Just like the list of vices that we talked about yesterday, this is not an all-inclusive list of all the possible godly characteristics we could have. Um, but it does provide a solid list of things and virtues that would be so important in the life of a community. So whenever we're talking about putting off and putting on, it affects things about our lives. First, it affects our individual life. As individuals, we need to be people who are putting off these things and putting on what Christ would have us to do. But these affect us as individuals because we build a reputation for ourselves by who we are. But it also represents who we are as a church community. We're always representing Christ and we're the body of Christ. So there's an aspect of it where we're more than representing ourselves. We're representing the church and we're representing Jesus with that. And ultimately, it's not for ourselves or for the church, but it's all for the glory of God. So we're going to jump into this list right now. First is compassionate hearts. Compassionate hearts. Compassionate hearts is a deep sensitivity to the needs and the sorrows of people around us. It's the opposite of a me-centered selfishness. It's practicing the idea of empathy. We're rejoicing with those who rejoice and we're weeping with those who are weeping. We see in Matthew 9.36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus is the picture of compassion that we're called to emulate. Next we have kindness. Kindness. This is the heartfelt compassion. It's when heartfelt compassion is coupled, paired with kindness, which is a Christ-centered attitude towards other people. It's a kindness that we show towards other people. It's both in the things that we say the things that we do, and the way that we do it. Um, I've heard it said in years past, kindness can sometimes be mixed in with weakness. But kindness is far from weakness. Kindness is actually a strength. Um, I've wrote down a little formula here. Truth plus kindness equals a very good thing. Flattery plus kindness is actually not kindness at all. And so the idea isn't that when we're kind to somebody that we just tell them what we want them to hear. It's not that kindness isn't flattering someone with something that's not true when we know we could be helping them in a different direction. Kindness is telling somebody the truth in a kind way. And that is what we're after here with kindness. In Romans 2.4, Paul writes, It is God's kindness that leads to repentance. God actually models kindness to us. And even in this kind of kindness, God is patient and he's kind with us, um, but it doesn't mean that he never rebukes us. So even God's kindness has that balance between telling the truth in love and doing it in such a kind way that we're, we're feeling the love that he has for us. Um, one author that I really enjoy, and I love his word pictures, he tweets these word pictures all the time, is Bob Goff. He said, throw kindness around like confetti. And I just love that word picture. Um, this isn't a biblical passage, but I love the idea that just throwing kindness around, being so kind to the people around you, um, that people just know you by how much you care and how you're going to be a kind person. So compassionate hearts, kindness, and now humility. So if kindness is a Christ-like attitude towards other people, humility is the Christ-like attitude towards oneself, supremely exemplified in our readiness to sacrifice for the needs of others. So it's putting ourselves on the line, knowing that we are ready to sacrifice ourselves over the needs of other people. We are no longer the most important. I am ready to sacrifice myself for another person. This is said very well in, as Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of each other. Love what C.S. Lewis wrote. You might have heard this quote before. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's thinking of yourself less. Next we have meekness. Meekness or gentleness, depending on your translation. Meekness is the effect, it's the effect of humility on one's approach to other people. 
And this is best, for me, I like looking at opposites. The opposite helps me understand what I'm talking about even more. This is, this is taking the place of rudeness and arrogance. So a meekness and gentleness is speaking the truth in love with a humility in the place of rudeness or arrogance. And we all know what that could look like to rudely tell someone or, or to arrogantly tell people what's true. It hurts, right? Sometimes someone's attitude, if they come to you, maybe they're telling you something that's true. Maybe it's something that you really need to hear. But at the same time, they're saying it in an arrogant and rude way. And you refuse to accept it. Or it hurts. It hurts more than it needs to. It doesn't lead you to change. It just leads you to a hurt feeling and resentment. Jesus said it well in Matthew 3, 5, 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Um, Christ sees meekness as a character that all Christians should go after. These aren't just things that we're naturally disposed to. He's calling all of us to meekness. So where are you in that area right now? Next, patience. So if meekness is the effect of humility on one's approach to other people, patience is the effect of that humble kindness on one's reaction to other people. Um, this is in the place of resentment and anger. This is in the place of resentment and anger. Um, so this is some, patience one of those things where people, if you've ever been in a friendship before, so I think that is all of us, if you've ever had friends before, you know that friends are going to eventually let you down, right? Is that correct? We're eventually going to be let down by someone we care about. And we're actually going to probably let other people down as well. So we're going to want this coming towards us. But patience is a virtue that's so relevant for all of us all the time. Um, patience is something that we need in relationships. Um, and patience is also something that we need with ourselves. Um, if, and as we strive to be like Jesus, we know that it's not an overnight thing. I think in a couple of our talks this week, I actually spoke into this saying that Becoming like Christ, this whole idea of growing into his image, is never an overnight transition. It's always a step-by-step, moment-by-moment walk with the Lord that sometimes takes days, weeks, years to see progress in certain aspects of our life. And actually, it's going to be an entire lifetime until Jesus returns for the new heavens and new earth before you see completion in yourself. But even for aspects of yourself, it's going to be a long process. So not only do we need patience with other people as we will let each other down, and we want to see growth in those areas, but we need patience with ourselves as we need to be in it for the long haul in our walk with God. So there's five virtues, five virtues, but Paul's not done yet. Uh, but I wait on one for, for uh, patience here. Psalm 130, verses 5 and 6. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and his word, and I, and I put my hope in him. Next, as we go through this passage, if you're still with me, Paul gives us two side notes to what he's just written, both of which could either solidify or derail your attempts at living out these five virtues that we just talked about. In other words, you could attempt to live out compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, but ultimately prove that you are not truly living out these characteristics if you fail in this two, these two areas. Let's look at them right now. Paul said this, he said, bearing with one another, bearing with one another. Um, as I studied this, I was actually surprised at kind of what I came out with the meaning for this. It's restraining our natural affections to odd and difficult people. We're letting people be themselves. We're understanding that we're all works in progress. God is working in us. And this is really a community thing. As we're living in community here in Shehi, but even the bigger community is the body of Christ. As you're living in this community, we need to bear with each other. That means that sometimes other people are just going to get on your nerves. There's people that just don't quite mesh with you or people that get under your skin. But as fellow brothers and sisters, we're called to love them. And loving them does not necessarily mean that you're going to be best friends. Loving someone does not necessarily mean you're going to be best friends. But loving does mean you're going to bear with them. That doesn't mean putting up with them, but it means caring for them in the process. So don't get hear me wrong. Not everybody is going to be your best friend. There will be people that are difficult for you to get along with. However, in the body of Christ, you're, you're, you're called to bear with them and react to them in positive ways and care for them. So you can love someone in that way. 
Second, if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must forgive. This one, I would say, is pretty self-explanatory. Forgive each other. Forgive each other. But simple does not mean easy, right? This is probably one of the most difficult things you'll be called to do on this side of heaven. Forgive someone, forgive somebody. There's those little things where someone says, oh, please forgive me, and you're like, oh, no big deal. That re didn't really hurt me that bad, really. But there's some things that people will do to you over time that are going to hurt. And this is where we're called to live out our Christ-likeness the most, is in forgiving people when it really hurts. And that is what Paul's calling us to do today, and I believe God is calling us to do. And this is one of those areas that you will not be able to do without his word being rooted inside of you and his Holy Spirit leading you to do this and empowering you to forgive other people. This is tough. But like Paul said here, these two things, these two side notes that I wrote, bearing with one another and forgiving each other are two things that could derail your pursuit of living out the fruit of the Spirit or these virtues that he's talking about. Because if you're not, you're not really compassionate, kind, humble, and meek and patient unless you're actually bearing with one another and actually forgiving people. There are most aren't, don't mesh together. And us really working on those two things are going to be vital to our walk with God and for God's glory in his body, the church. And finally, and finally, put on love. Above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So, the Colossian church must clothe themselves with the robe of love, which binds all these virtues together. And in many ways, love is the lowest common denominator behind all the virtues listed. So literally, it does bind everything together in perfect harmony. So it does something for us inwardly, like we talked about in our own walk with God. It does something outwardly as we seek to be a different person with our friends. And it does something even larger as we bring God the glory as we represent him with the body of Christ. Remembering that he is the head of that body, like we talked about on day two. So now, I want to make a little plug for the local church. As we've come in all these directions this week, we've talked about our individual walks, we've talked about what it means to have that relationship with God. All these things that we talked about aren't relevant unless you first have that relationship with Jesus. Trusting in him with your entire life, knowing that he came to this earth on a rescue mission for you, died on the cross for your sins, rose again, and is coming again to rescue us again in the new heavens and new earth. And so first we need that relationship with him in the first place. Then we talked about what does it look like to grow in that relationship, to put off the old self, and then to be rooted in him instead, and to put on these new virtues instead, be representing him in the world um, as people who are following after him and being more like him in our compassion and so on. But now I want to talk to you a little bit about the local church. The local church. Many of you are staying here for another week, but this will be relevant to you soon. But some of you are going home tomorrow. But when you do go home, I want to consider the role that you have in the local church. Maybe you already are totally invested in the local church, active in that place, um, being a part of the body. However, I want to still challenge you. Consider your role. Your local church is full of different kinds of people. Here at Shehi, is probably, you're probably more with similar people. Um, and so it is probably in some ways a little simpler to be, a, be part of the body here because you're like-minded with your music and age and a lot of other things. But as you get into the body of Christ, you're going to be with a lot of different kinds of people. And that's a good thing. Um, and it's not just an icing on the cake kind of good, like, oh, there's a lot of people here. That's good. But it's an essential kind of good. That's why it's the body of Christ. And it all, because it also gets messy. When you're together with a group of redeemed sinners, um, there is going to be conflict and there is going to be messiness. But we're called to that kind of group because that's where we're called to live out these virtues we talked about. That's where we're called, talked about to be compassionate towards one another, to be patient, to be kind, to love each other, to forgive each other. We're called to do that as the body of Christ. And that's not always going to be easy. It's actually 
counterintuitive, especially in our culture, but that's how we grow personally, and that's how we grow as a body and as a group. It's as when we do have conflicts, when we do have those tough times, it's when we come together in unity and forgive one another, when we love and care for each other. And so when a difference arises, we don't just run the other direction and hide from them and say, I guess I'm not going to be friends with them anymore. No, it's we come together with them and we talk it out. We talk it out and we bear with one, in, with one another as the body of Christ. And so it's okay, like I talked about. You're not going to be best friends with everybody, but we're going to learn to love and care for each other as the body of Christ. And that's the, what, what God's calling us to do. Because because we are called to be the body of Christ in a world that doesn't know him. We're called to be lights in a dark world. And that's how we bring glory to God, and that's how we represent him. And as we kind of journeyed this week through the work that God did in our lives, to the work he's doing in this group, to the thing he's, things he's calling us to put off, and the things he's calling us to put on, my call to you is to do those things as the body of Christ, representing him as a light in a dark world, bringing him all the honor and all the glory. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, we thank you for this week we had together. We thank you for um, the, the letter to the Colossians being as relevant for us as it was to the ri original readers 2,000 years ago. We thank you that you used the Apostle Paul um, to talk to us, to speak to us, to show us your love, and to show us your patience and kindness to us. Um, Lord, you're so slow to anger and so merciful to us as we are slow to grow so many times. Lord, thank you for that. We also thank you that you do continue to work in us and that we do see spiritual growth day by day and year by year. I just pray that we can be committed to this growth, um, not just as individuals, but as a body that will push each other on to grow and love each other and that will hold each other accountable. Not only as a group here in Shehi, but also as a group in the local church um, called to love the world, Lord. We just um, thank you for what you're doing with us. We're excited to see what you'll do in the future. Um, I pray, pray for these campers, um, that they will continue to walk in you, and that as they go home, they will go um, being rooted in you and your word by the power of your Holy Spirit, going back to be your representatives in this world. In your name, amen. <laughs>